Before starting the video make sure to hit the subscribe button if you are new to my channel, it really motivates me to keep on creating anime recaps for you guys. The story starts with our protagonist waking up in an unfamiliar place, and he wonders where he is. He notices a lake around him, and he remembers that he was going somewhere on his bike, and then he saw a vending machine which was about to fall, and he died while trying to save the vending machine. He thinks that he should have died, but somehow, he is still alive, and he notices that his body won't move. He then tries to speak, but he observes that he can only say certain words, and he thinks that he has heard these words countless number of times. He states that he is a vending machine fanatic, and he can never mistake that sound, and he then notices that he is turned into a vending machine. He wonders if he has been reborn into a vending machine, and he thinks that this shouldn't be possible, but it's true. He then admires his vending machine body, and he thinks that being reborn as vending machine is not so bad for a vending machine fanatic like him. He then checks out everything that he is able to say, and he wonders what else he can do. He then notices that currently he is selling mineral water and corn soup, and he can use points to change the items that he is selling. He notices that he has a thousand points, and he finds out that points are converted from money, and spending them enables replenishment, changing of goods, and acquisition of new functions. Upon further investigating he finds out that he can use points to keep things warm or cold, and he can also warm up frozen foods, and add water to cup ramen. He then checks what other items he can sell, and he notices that he can sell pretty much anything that someone would buy from a vending machine. He then adds cold milk tea to his menu by spending 10 points. He thinks that 100 yen is good for the price, and he explains that he can convert 100 yen to 1 point. He then checks his other functions, and he realizes that his body doesn't run on electricity, instead it uses points to function, and it uses 1 point every hour. He thinks that he needs to earn at least 2,400 yen a day, and he notices that he has 900 points left so he can function for a month. He thinks he should not waste points until his income is steady, and he wonders if any customers are going to show up in this place. A day passes by, and he thinks that he is just losing points, and at this rate he will stop functioning. A frog then shows up there, and the vending machine observes that it's as big as a human. The frog wonders what this is, and he starts to hit the vending machine. This makes the vending machine lose durability, and the machine finds out that he will be unusable if the durability is exhausted. He then notices that only 83 points of durability are left, and it's steadily decreasing because of the frog's attacks. He then finds out that durability can be restored by spending points, and he thinks that he might be able to get through this as he still has 900 points. The frog then summons his buddies there, and they all start hitting the vending machine. The vending machine thinks that this is bad, and he wonders if there is a function he can use to get through this. The vending machine then notices the blessing skill, and the system tells him that this skill can be used to get a special power from God, and it can be used without spending any points. He then uses it, and he chooses the barrier as his special skill, as it can protect him from things that he deems dangerous. He then deploys the barrier, and he notices that the barrier is using a lot of his points. The frogs try to break the barrier, but they can't and they give up after a while. The vending machine then recovers his durability, and he notices that he has 311 points left. He thinks that he can still function for 10 days, but he will stop functioning unless someone buys something. He hopes that someone shows up during this time, and several days later the vending machine still hasn't sold anything. A girl then shows up there, and she is looking for monsters, and she is glad when they don't show up. She thinks that this is good as she is too hungry to fight, and she even dropped her food bag. She states that she is not cut out to be a hunter, and she then notices the vending machine. She observes that it has some drinks and soup inside of it, and the vending machine then says hello. He asks her to insert coins, and the girl wonders if a copper coin will work. She then inserts the coin, and the coin returns back. The vending machine then finds out that he will have to acquire the coin conversion function to accept this coin, and he acquires it. The girl then notices that the numbers changed from 100 yen to 1000 ua, and she finds out that she needs a silver coin for this. She then uses a silver coin to buy corn soup, and she drinks it. She thinks that it's tastier than anything she has ever had, and the vending machine is happy to be able to please someone this much. The girl then finishes her soup, and she thinks that the other stuff in the machine must be good as well. She then buys three more corn soups along with water and the milk tea. 
The vending machine thinks that he earned a total of 6,300 yen today, and he has recovered 63 points. The hunter girl then falls asleep, and the vending machine protects her using his barrier. The next day the girl wakes up, and she thanks the vending machine for all the food. The vending machine thanks her as well, and the girl wonders if the machine can talk. She thinks that he might only be able to say certain things, and she states that someone she knows is good at inventing tools just like him, and she wonders if this machine is same as those tools. She asks him to say something if it's correct, and the vending machine says hello. She can't believe that the vending machine can understand her, and she thinks that Hulami will be impressed if she knew this. The girl then introduces herself as Lanny's, and she tells the vending machine to say hello when he means yes, and say too bad when he means no. Lamis then asks him if he can tell her his name, and the machine states that he can't. She then wonders if he is lonely, and the machine states that he is, and Lamis wonders if it would be alright if she moves him, and takes him to Hulami, and the machine agrees to this. Lamis then lifts up the machine, and the machine wonders how this is possible as he should weigh around 500 kilograms. Later, on their journey the machine finds out that Lamis has the blessing called the Blessing of Might, and this explains her incredible strength. On the way Lamis takes a short break as she is hungry, and the machine thinks that the corn soup is not that filling, and he stocks up on some chips. Lamis then buys the chips, and she likes it, and she buys a lot more of it. Thanks to this the machine now has 320 points, and he uses the points to reduce the price of the mineral water by 300 uwa. Lamis then states that they will soon reach the entrance of this level, and she mentions that there is a village after that, and they can take it easy there. The scene cuts to Lamis arriving at the village, and the guards are happy to see that she is alright. They mention that they were worried about her when her group came back without her, and they wonder what this strange contraption is. Lamy states that it's a magic tool with its own will, and it gives you items when you put money in it. The guards mention that they have never heard of anything like this existing in this level, and Lamis wonders if she shouldn't have brought it here. The guards state that it's no problem as whoever finds something lying around in this dungeon gets the right of its ownership. The vending machine then wonders if he is inside some kind of labyrinth, and the guards wonder if they can also buy some things from the machine. Lamy states that they can, and the machine then says hello to them. The guards are surprised to see the machine talk, and they then buy the corn soup and milk tea, and they think that it's really good. They then try the other stuff in the machine, and they think that this machine is great, and they mentioned that it would be great if Lamis could bring the machine here from time to time. Lamis agrees, and the scene cuts to them in the village. Lamis notices that some people are bullying a kid in a dark alley, and she picks a fight with the bullies. Lamis can't hit the bullies with her attacks, but they get scared after seeing her strength, and they run away. Lamis then wonders if the girl is alright, and the girl states that she is fine. The scene then changes to Lamis at an inn, and Manami, the innkeeper's daughter, and Lamis's friend is glad to see that Lamis is alright. She states that she was worried about her when she heard that the hunters with her left her behind, and she badmouthed those hunters to so many people that they won't be able to make a living in this village anymore. Manami then wonders what that thing is, and Lamis explains the vending machine to Manami. Manami then states that Lamis will have to go to the surface to meet Hulami and she wonders if Lamis has enough money to pay for the transfer circle. Lamy states that she doesn't, and Manami mentions that she will let Lamis work at their inn until she manages to make enough money. She thinks that they can use the vending machine to attract some customers, and sometime later the people started to gather around the machine after word about its delicious snacks spread around. At night Lamis carries the machine and places it in front of the gate, and at the gate we see that the guards are already bored of all the snacks in the machine. The machine then notices that he now has over 3,000 points, and he introduces Ken Odin to the menu, and the guards try it despite its steep price. They think that it's great, and several days later the others also found out about the Ken Odin, and this caused a boom in the village, and a new sports drink that the machine introduced recently also sells well. The girl saved by Lamis then comes to the machine, and hearing the machine talk she gets startled, and she thinks that she was going to talk first to have the negotiating advantage. The girl then leaves after throwing a rock at the machine, and the machine wonders what her deal is. Later Lamis hopes that one day the machine can do lots of talking, and she states that this is why she wants to take him to Hulami soon. She then names the machine Boxo, as not having a name is a little inconvenient, and the machine thinks that life in another world as a vending machine is not so bad. 
The story continues, and a bear is standing in front of Boxo. Boxo wonders what's the deal with this bear, and Lamis then recognizes the bear as the director of the Hunters Association. She wonders why he is here, and the director states that there is a plan to go attack a frog fiend base soon, and he would like for both Boxo and Lamis to take part in it. Lamy states that Boxo can't fight, and the director mentions that he wants Boxo to provide food and drinks while they are on the road. He states that warm and ready-to-eat food will be invaluable for hunters, and he mentions that he will make sure that they are well guarded if they come along. Lamis then asks Boxo if he is willing to accept this job, and Boxo agrees as both the village and Lamis will be exposed to danger if they ignore the frog fiends. The scene then cuts to the hunters on their way to slay the frog fiends, and Boxo thinks that it's been three days since they had that talk with the director. He explains that according to the director the survival of the village is important, but the most important thing is that they don't lose custody of the transfer circle. He thinks that Monami was saying that frog fiends are troublesome because they lay lots of eggs during breeding season and their numbers increase by a lot. A few people then talk about how there are more frog fiends than usual this year, and Lamy starts worrying hearing this. The scene then cuts to the hunters setting up camp, and a man named Carrioil tells Lamis to not be afraid of the frog fiends as they are here to guard her. He then looks at Boxo, and he states that he has heard a lot about him. Lamis tells him that he can buy food and drinks by putting money inside it, and Carrioil tries it by buying some lemon tea. Carrioil then thinks that he has never seen a container like this, and Lamy states that the empty container also disappears by themselves so there is no need to worry about trash. Carrioil then tastes the tea, and he thinks that this is great. He wonders how they refill Boxo, and Lamy's mentions that they have never refilled him even though he has sold hundreds of items. Carrioil thinks that this is interesting, and he summons a girl named Philmina from his group. Philmina asks her captain what he wants, and Carrie Oil states that Philmina knows a lot about magic tools and ancient treasure, and he wonders if she knows what this Boxo thing is. Looking at Boxo Philmina states that she doesn't feel any magic power from it, and it seems like an ordinary block of iron. Carrie Oil mentions that Boxo must be using some kind of dimensional storage to refill his stock, and Philmina states that there are blessings which allow this kind of thing, but a block of iron shouldn't be able to use blessings. Boxo thinks that they don't know, but he can use blessings. Carrioil then mentions that he doesn't get what Boxo really is, but he is glad that it's helping them out. The scene then cuts to the hunters buying their food from Boxo, and Boxo thinks that he has added a new function for the sake of this campaign. He reveals that he has added cup noodles to his inventory, and the hunters really like the cup noodles. Lamis is eating the noodles besides a white-haired girl, and the girl introduces herself as Shui and she also loves the cup noodles. Afterwards the director shows up there, and he states that it will take them three hours to reach the frog fiend's den from here, and he asks Lamis to decide whether she wants to stay here or come to the battlefield with them. Lamis mentions that she has no problems going to the battlefield as she is a hunter, but she doesn't want Boxo to be dragged into battle. Boxo states that he is fine with it, and Lamis then mentions that her and Boxo will also join the battle. Later Boxo thinks that he is going to protect Lamis as she is his first friend in this world. The next day everyone walks towards the frog's den, and they hear the frog fiends ahead, and the battle starts. Boxo wonders if Lamis will be alright as she is not good at aiming her attacks, but Lamis actually manages to hit the frogs. Boxo thinks that having him on her back might have changed Lamis's center of gravity which allowed her to land the attack. Boxo is happy to help Lamis even if it's indirectly and we then see Kirioil's group killing the frog fiends one after the other. They think that there are too many of them, and Philmina states that they can't handle this many. Kirioil mentions that they can whine about it later, but they have to get through this somehow for now. A frog fiend then tries to attack Lamis, and Boxo puts up a barrier to protect her. Seeing this Shui wonders if this is Lamis's power, and Lamis states that it's not. Boxo then thinks that this was close, and he thinks that he needs to widen his field of view. He then notices an ability called Omnidirectional Vision, and he buy it using a thousand points, and this lets him see more. Lamis then tells Boxo to let her know if an enemy is behind her, and Boxo chooses a phrase to inform her of this. Carrioil then commends Lamis for her outstanding destructive power, and this makes Lamis blush. Right then Boxo warns Lamis about some incoming frogs, but Lamis is too busy blushing to hear him, and Boxo uses his shield to protect her again. Carrioil wonders if this is Lamis's power, 
and Lamy states that this might be Boxo's power. This makes Carrie Oil more interested in Boxo, and seeing the look on his face Boxo thinks that he needs to be careful of Carrie Oil. Carrie Oil's group then manages to take down all the frog fiends around them, and he tells his group to cut off their tongues as the proof of the kill. Carrie Oil then wonders what they should do next, and he states that they could earn some more money if they go to the front lines. Filmina mentions that their duty is to guard Lammies and Boxo, and Carrie Oil states that it would be better for their group's finances if they make some more money right now. Filmina then mentions that they can go to the front lines, but only if Lammies consents to this. Carrie Oil then asks Lammies what she thinks about this, and Lammies states that she would like to help the people in the front lines if they are having trouble. The scene then cuts to their group defeating the last of the frog fiends, and after the battle Lammies carries the wounded to the cart. Boxo thinks that he doesn't like the fact that he can't help Lammies in this situation, and he then provides the injured with free sports drinks to help them heal better. The director then thanks Carrie Oil's group, the Menagerie of Fools, for their help with protecting Lammies and Boxo, and he states that the numbers of the frog fiends were double than what he expected. Carrie Oil mentions that there can only be one reason for this, and the director states that there is a good chance that a king frog fiend has arisen. Boxo wonders what that is, and he thinks that it sounds strong. The director then mentions that he would have to relieve Carrie Oil's group from their guard duty if a king frog fiend has appeared, and Carrie Oil tells the director to leave things to them. The director then asks Lammies and Boxo to remain here and provide food for the wounded and the hunters, and Lammies understands. Later after everyone has left Lammies goes to treat the wounded, leaving Boxo alone, and she asks him to not feel lonely while she is gone. After Lammies leaves, a weird man shows up in front of Boxo, and he tries to steal his money, but Boxo gives him a sports drink, and when the man tries to pick it up, he drops some scorching hot corn soup on him. This makes the man shout in agony, and he tries to break Boxo apart, but Lammies knocks him out, and she ties him up. The king frog fiend then comes there and the group tries to get away using the cart, but the animals pulling the cart are too scared to move. Lammies then calms the animals down, and she frees them. The others wonder what she is doing, and Lammy states that she will be pulling the cart in their place. The cart then starts to move, and Boxo wonders what he should do to get out of this predicament. He thinks that his barrier might be able to save Lammies, but it won't be able to cover all of them, and he wonders if he has some way to slow the beast. He wonders if he can use some item to accomplish this, and he then changes his stock with cola. He drops down the colas, and Lammies wonders if he wants them to use this item, and Boxo states that he does. Boxo then buys a new function called Form Change, and he becomes a candy machine. He then gives Lammies and the others some candies, and he wonders how he is going to explain to them what they have to do. He tells her to insert coins, and Lammies wonders what Boxo is trying to say. Boxo thinks that this is the best he can do, as he is limited by his vocabulary, and the king frog fiend closes in on them. The others then think that Boxo might be broken, and Lammy states that she knows that Boxo is trying to tell her something. Boxo can't believe that Lammy's is trusting him even in this situation, and the knocked out man from earlier then wakes up, and he shouts in fear seeing the king frog fiend. The others shove some candy down his throat to shut him up, and they give him some cola when he asks for water and this makes the cola gush out in pressure. Seeing this Lammies tries to add the candy to the cola, and this makes the cola gush out, and she wonders if this is what Boxo was trying to say. Boxo replies with yes, and everyone uses this trick to shoot cola in the king frog fiend's eyes. Carrie Oil and the other hunters then arrive there, and they notice the king frog fiend. They then attack and defeat the monster, and everyone then thanks Boxo. Later the director states that he was scared seeing Lammies in danger, and he apologizes for putting her through it. Lammies mentions that she should be the one to apologize for acting on a whim, and the director then tells everyone to head back to the village. The story continues, and the hunters return to the village after finishing their battle with the frog fiends, and they notice smoke coming from the direction of the village. The director then mentions that there is one more thing that they have to do today, and Lammies wonders if Manami and the innkeeper are all right. Boxo then uses a mixture of his dialogues to tell Lammies that she won't know what's wrong until they go there and look, and Lammies understands him. Everyone then enters the village, and they notice that it's heavily damaged. Lammies notices that the inn has also been crushed, and she tries to go inside, but Boxo tells her to calm down using the same method as earlier. Lammies then thinks that Munami might have evacuated somewhere, 
and she thinks that they must be at the Hunters Association. At the Hunters Association they notice a slain snake, and Lamys observes that the guards are there. The guards mentions that Lamys doesn't need to worry as everyone is alright, and they are inside the Hunters Guild. Boxo then notices that the Hunters Guild has a really strong defense mechanism, and Monami and the innkeeper welcome Lamys back. They are glad to see that Lamys is all right, and Lamys feels the same. Boxo then thinks that he is glad that everyone is okay, and even though he hasn't known them for long, he doesn't want to lose any of them. He then states that everything will be free today, and at night everyone parties eating Boxo's snacks, and the snake they slew. Boxo can't believe that the people here eat the monsters that they defeat, and he mentions that he made some new customers today since he offered everything for free. He thinks that the free stuffs will end tonight, and tomorrow he is going to make lots of money. Lamys then comes to Boxo, and she mentions that they have been through a lot since they went on that expedition. She states that she is glad that everyone is still alive, and she is happy to see everyone gather around Boxo. She mentions that this makes her feel like Boxo has become an important part of this place, and she then falls asleep. The next day the merchants are busy getting their shops ready, and Boxo thinks that there will be lots of carpenters around the hunters on guard duty. He then thinks that Lamys was summoned by the director, and he hopes that her assessment as a hunter improved as a result of that expedition. Lamys then comes there, and she tells Boxo that she received a personal request from the director for rubble removal. Lamys then goes to the inn to remove the rubble around there, and some more hunters come there to help her. They think that they are in luck since Boxo is also here, and they then notice Lamys removing the rubble easily with her brute strength, and they are surprised to see this. Carrioil then comes there, and he mentions that he has come here to deliver a bribe to the hard-working youngsters. He states that they can choose whatever they like from Boxo, and Lamys chooses some normal things, and Monami states that they should choose the most expensive things at times like these. Carrioil then asks Lamys if she would like to join their hunter party, and he invites Boxo as well, but Lamys refuses. The other hunters there wonder why Lamys refused, and Lamys mentions that she can't leave right now as they need all the help they can get rebuilding the village. The scene then cuts to Akawi from the exchange house talking with Boxo, and Lamys wonders what she wants. Akawi states that she has come here because they received word that this stratum is low on silver coins, and Lamys mentions that it must be because Boxo gets paid with silver coins only. Akawi states that this is what she expected, and she mentions that she has a hundred gold coins with her and she would like to exchange them with Boxo's silver coins. Boxo thinks that one gold coin is worth a hundred silver coins, but he refuses as he doesn't have an exchange function. Lamys then states that they might get some change if they buy something with a gold coin, and Akawi tries it, and she receives some silver coins as change. Akawi thinks that this will work, and she keeps repeating this. She then stops after a while, and she states that she will come back another day to make more purchases. Lamys then states that Boxo is really rich, and she tells him to watch out for thieves. The scene then cuts to an old man trying his luck with the lottery function in Boxo, but he loses. Boxo then states that he recently added this digital lottery function, and since he installed this his sales have gone up by 30%. The old man then thinks about trying his luck once again, but his wife drags him away reminding him that they have something to do today. Lamys then comes there and she mentions that she has sent a letter to Hulami, but there has been no reply. She thinks that Hulami is probably still hanging in a stratum somewhere, and she asks Boxo to wait until Hulami contacts her. The director then comes there, and he asks them to come to the association as he has something to discuss. At the association the director states that the two of them did really well on their recent mission, and he thanks them. He then states that he has a favor to ask of Boxo, and he asks Lamis to leave the room. Lamys leaves, and the director mentions that many people are hoping to migrate to the village due to the recent events, but a population increase brings with it a range of issues. He states that hygiene is what he is concerned about, and he mentions that the bear fiends like him don't have any physical desires outside of breeding season, but the humans are different. Diseases often spread around because of these things, which delays reconstruction, and Boxo understands why the director wanted Lamys to leave the room. The director then summons Shirley into the room, and Boxo thinks that she is pretty. She states that it would be a delight for the village to grow more energized, but if they tighten the regulations to deal with the hygiene issues then it will create other problems. Boxo thinks that one thing does come to his mind to protect against such diseases, 
but he wonders if they will be able to understand it. Boxo then changes his form, and he gives them a box of condoms. Shirley notices that the box costs 10 silver coins, and she then looks inside it. She takes the condom out, and she wonders what it is. The director states that there is also a paper in the box, and seeing the diagrams in the paper surely understands how to use this thing. She mentions that she will purchase a large amount of this and distribute them in the entertainment quarters, and the scene then cuts to Boxo outside the inn. He thinks that there is a girl who shows up every afternoon, and he has been overlooking her bouts of mischief, but he won't do this today. The girl then shows up with some stones, and Boxo startles her by saying something. Some bodyguards then take the girl back with them, and they state that Miss Swarry's tomboyish antics are troublesome. The next day Swarry shows up again, and Boxo gives her some corn soup for free. Swarry thanks him, and the scene then cuts to Boxo in the bathhouse. Boxo notices the girls changing, and he thinks that he is glad that he is not made of flesh and blood. Lammies then asks Boxo to give her the usual, and she buys some liquid hair cleaner. Boxo states that this is why he has been installed here, and some more customers then come into the bathhouse. They notice that Boxo is here, and they think that they should stock up on fur wash. They mention that the males will take notice of them if they improve their furs with this, and they state that the smell the fur wash gives off is also very nice. Lammies and Shirley then drink some coffee milk after their bath, and Boxo thinks that nothing beats coffee milk after having a bath. The scene then changes to the old man from before buying something from Boxo with his granddaughter, and the granddaughter asks him what these numbers are for. The old man mentions that they can get an item for free if all the numbers are the same, and winning here can make someone happy for the rest of their day. The granddaughter then tries it, and we see that his wife is talking with their daughter, and the daughter apologizes to her for being a bad daughter and leaving her alone. The wife state that it's fine as long as she is alright, and meanwhile the granddaughter wins the lottery from Boxo, and she uses it to buy some water, and she gives it to her grandfather. The grandfather then thinks that the day is almost over, and it's a waste that this will only make her happy for a while. The granddaughter states that it's fine as she has been happy all day today because she got to meet him and her grandmother. The family then leaves, and the scene cuts to the director saying that he has heard that Boxo can use mimicry to blend in with his surroundings. Boxo states that it's true, and he uses it. The director then mentions that he would like for Boxo to use this ability to hide in an area where crime rates have been high, and identify the offender. He states that they should first test how useful this mimicry skill is, and the scene cuts to Boxo standing opposite to the Hunters Association using his mimicry skill. Lamis then comes out of the association looking for Boxo, and Monami reminds her that the director is borrowing him. She then asks Lamis if she wants to help out around the inn today, and Lamis states that she will help out at the association today so she can meet Boxo whenever he comes back. The scene then cuts to Lamis helping out around the association, and at the evening Swari comes looking for Boxo to buy some fruit juice. She then meets Lamis, and she asks her if she has given any thought to what she asked her earlier. Lamis mentions that she is not going to sell Boxo no matter how much money Swari gives her, and Swari states that she can give Lamis so much money that her next three generations can lead a luxurious life. Lamis mentions that Boxo is not her property, and he can't be replaced with money. Swari then states that Lamis restricts Boxo too much, and he would be happier living with her in her magnificent residence. Swari then asks Lamis what Boxo really is as he doesn't seem like a normal magic tool, and Lamis mentions that she is not sure about this either, but he can understand anything they say, and he responds accordingly, so he must be the same as any other human. Swari then states that she will use all her time and money to acquire Boxo, and she leaves as Boxo isn't around today. Boxo then says hello to Lamis, and Lamis can't believe that he was there this whole time. She then states that a lot of things happened today, and she asks Boxo if he would like to hear about them, and Boxo mentions that he would love to. The story continues, and Boxo thinks that the weather is nice today. He then notices some animals in the wild, and he thinks that they are cute. We then notice that Boxo is on a cart with some suspicious people, and he thinks that he has been rattling around on this cart for the last eight hours. He wonders where these guys are taking him, and the story then goes back in time by eight hours. Some guys tell Boxo that the director has hired them to reinforce the village walls starting today, and he wants Boxo to set up shop there for a while. Boxo then notices that the guy who tried to rob him earlier is also with them, and he wonders if he has reformed. 
Boxo then thinks that this should be fine as it's the director's request, and he agrees. The guys then carry Boxo onto the cart, and back to the present Boxo thinks that he should have been more suspicious of them. He wonders how far they are going to travel, and he then checks his points just to be safe. He notices that he has more than 11,000 points, and he thinks that his barrier would only last for three hours with this. The thieves then stop the cart to take a break, and Boxo records their faces with his security camera just to be safe. One of the crooks then tells Boxo to hurry up and give him some food and drinks, and he mentions that even an iron box should know what will happen if it doesn't cooperate. Boxo doesn't give them anything, and the crook then attacks him. Their boss then tells him to stop as they may be after the money inside of it, but this thing in itself might be of some value. He tells them to avoid damaging it, and he tells Boxo to do as he is told if he doesn't want to get busted up. Boxo then makes fun of the boss's head, and the boss then tells his lackeys to use some physical persuasion after confirming that Boxo can heal itself. The thieves then hit Boxo from all sides, and Boxo's durability keeps on decreasing. Boxo thinks that they aren't doing much damage, but he hates to stand there and take it. He thinks that it would be a bit nicer if his body were sturdier, and the system lady then asks him if he would like to spend thousand points to increase his durability. Boxo agrees, and the crooks can't damage him anymore. The boss then states that they should stop here for now, and he notices that Boxo hasn't repaired himself. He then tells the crook Goodwill that he should know what will happen to him if it's broken, and Boxo then gives them some juice, and they think that it's not broken. The thieves then drink the juice, and they spit it out, and Boxo reveals that this is one of the worst drinks that he has. Afterwards the thieves arrive at their hideout, and the boss tells his lackeys to lug the box inside and have their guests look at it. The lackeys state that the person inside isn't going to do what they want her to, and the boss mentions that their heads are coming off if they don't. The lackeys then carry Boxo inside, and they tell someone that they have brought a toy that she is sure to like, and they ask her to look into it. They give her the documentation for Boxo, and we see that they are afraid of this girl. The girl states that they should look someone in the eye when they are talking with them, and she wonders if they are scared of a feeble girl like her. The thieves then run away shutting her inside, and after reading the documentation the girl wonders if Boxo is really a magical tool with a mind of its own. Boxo wonders whether he should reply to her or not, and the girl then introduces herself as Hulami, a famous magic item engineer, and she mentions that the thieves kidnapped her to study Boxo. Boxo thinks that she is the person that Lamis wanted him to meet, and he answers her question with a yes. Hulami then checks out what Boxo's different dialogues mean, and she thinks that even she has tried endowing magic items with human intelligence, but she concluded that it's not possible with current technology. She mentions that she then tried to reverse her thinking, and she thought that maybe she could put a human soul inside a magic item. Boxo can't believe that she thought of this on her own, and Hulami then gets thirsty. Boxo gives her something warm to drink, and Hulami thinks that it's great. Afterwards Hulami asks Boxo if he is a magic item with someone's soul inside, and Boxo states that he is. Hulami then asks Boxo some more questions, and she finds out that Boxo doesn't have a master, and he still has his memory from when he was a human. Hulami also finds out that Boxo needs money to replenish his inventory, and he can do something else with it as well. Boxo thinks that it would be faster to show her, and he changes his form. Hulami then finds out that Boxo was able to change his functions by using money, and she wonders if he can do something else. Boxo then uses his barrier, and Hulami is surprised to see that Boxo can even use blessings. Hulami states that Boxo is really amazing, and Boxo thinks that he was just lucky to receive an outstanding vending machine body. He thinks that her intellect is what's really amazing, and the scene then cuts to Hulami sleeping. Boxo wonders if anyone has noticed that he is gone, and he hopes that Lamis doesn't do something rash in worry. The thieves then come into the room, and they state that they should teach Hulami a lesson while she is asleep. Boxo thinks that he knows how to stop this, and he then changes his form. He then gives the thieves some pervy magazines, and they think that these are great. The thieves then head to their rooms to take care of urgent business, and Boxo is glad that this worked out. The next day one of the thieves leaves some food for Hulami, and Hulami thinks that it must be morning since the food is here. She wonders if they can't give her something better than this, and she states that she hasn't been eating well as she is wary of them slipping something weird into the food. 
Boxo then gives Hulami some bread, and Hulami thinks that it's good. Hulami then eats some more snacks that Boxo gives her, and this satisfies her hunger. The boss of the thieves then comes there, and he wonders if Hulami has found anything about the box. Hulami states that she is not going to take orders from him, and the boss mentions that he is not a patient man, and he gives her two days to figure out this box, and how to get money out of it. Boxo thinks that he needs to find a way to escape until then, and later he notices that Hulami's hair is a mess, but there is no bath here. Boxo then gets an idea, and he gives Hulami some hot water and shampoo. He uses his dialogues to tell her what to do, and Hulami figures out that Boxo is telling her to wash her hair with this. Hulami thinks that she hasn't washed them ever since she has been locked here, and she then washes her hair. Boxo thinks that he has been hoping for the events to lead to this situation, and he thinks that reincarnation is really great. Boxo then thinks that their time limit will be up tomorrow morning, and he wonders if he should attract the thieves to make an opportunity for Hulami to run away. Hulami then tells Boxo that he should forget about sacrificing himself so she can get away, if he is thinking it. She states that there are hordes of monsters in these parts, and she wouldn't be able to get away even if he does it. She mentions that they should just put up with this, and wait for their chance, and she states that Boxo doesn't have to worry about her as she is not afraid of dying. Hulami then goes to bed, and later at night Boxo feels some tremors outside. He thinks that someone must have launched an attack, and he wakes Hulami up. She notices that the thieves are getting attacked, and she thinks that this is their chance. Boxo then hears Lamis calling out to him, and Hulami wonders what Lamis is doing here. She thinks that the Hunters Association must have made their move, and she wonders why Lamis is calling out Boxo's name. She then finds out that Boxo knows her, and she thinks they will be saved now, and they should stay here so they don't get in the Hunters' way. She then asks Boxo to help her out if it comes down to it, and we see that the ceiling is slowly collapsing. Hulami thinks that they might be in some trouble as the storehouse above them has some explosives along with the gold coins hoard by the thieves, and the ceiling then collapses due to an explosion. Boxo protects himself and Hulami using his barrier, and Hulami thanks him for it. She wonders if Boxo can maintain this barrier indefinitely, and Boxo states that he can't. Boxo thinks that they are going to be crushed at some point, and he thinks that he can probably manage to survive if he increases his toughness, but he doesn't want to forsake Hulami. Hulami then wonders if Boxo needs money to maintain this barrier, and Boxo states that he does. She then shows Boxo a bag of gold coins above them, and Boxo lets the bag pass through his barrier. Hulami then uses the coins to keep buying goods from Boxo to give him all the points he needs, and by the end of this Boxo has enough points to hold his barrier out for three days. He thinks that now they just have to wait for Lamis to dig them out, and he notices that Hulami is not feeling well. Boxo realizes this must be due to the lack of oxygen inside the barrier, and he then turns into an oxygen vending machine, and Hulami uses the oxygen mask to get some air. Hulami then thanks Boxo for this, and she mentions that she wouldn't be able to resist Boxo if he were a man in the flesh. Hearing this makes Boxo's heart pound, and he then hears Lamis calling out to him. Boxo replies to her, and Lamis is glad to find him. Boxo then lets her inside his barrier, and the scene then cuts to all of them outside the caved-in building. Lamis is crying while hugging Boxo, and she apologizes to him for taking her eyes off of him. Boxo thinks that he doesn't have arms to hug her back, and neither does he have a mouth to tell her some comforting words. We then see that Menagerie of Fools are also here, and Philmina states that it's unusual for Carrioil to help with a job which doesn't pay. Carrioil mentions that he is always kind to himself and others, and Philmina states that he must be doing this to have Boxo owe him a favor so it will be easier to persuade him. Carrioil mentions that the Menagerie has a goal to accomplish, and for that he is willing to use any means, and Boxo is vital for making that goal a reality. Lamis then notices that Hulami is also here, and Hulami can't believe that Lamis just noticed her. Hulami states that she is glad that they managed to get Boxo out of there, and Boxo then gives her a drink. The story continues with Lamis fishing, and she punches the fish out of the water. Hulami then tells Lamis that her strength is amazing, and her parents would be happy to get these fish. Lamis states that she always breaks things at home as she is so strong and because of that her mom and dad are always laughing in embarrassment. Lamis then hears Boxo's voice, and we see that she is dreaming, and she asks Boxo to never leave her again. 
Hulami then tells Boxo that Lanny's kept looking for him the entire time Boxo was missing, and she didn't even sleep. She states that it might overlap with that old incident for her, and she then tells Boxo that long ago a small village was attacked and wiped out by monsters. Lamis and her were among the few survivors, and they both lost their parents back then. Lamis also had her strength back then, but she didn't do anything and ever since she has regretted it. Boxo then wonders if he can do anything to help her out, and Lamis then asks Boxo to be with her forever in her sleep, and Boxo thinks that he would be happy to stick around. The scene then cuts to them all back in the village, and Hulami states that she has decided to stay in the village for now. Lamis mentions that Hulami can ask her if she doesn't understand anything, and she then leaves for some reconstruction work. Swari's bodyguards then come to Hulami and Boxo, and they mention that Swari will come to make a request of them soon, and they want them to accept it. Hulami states that they can't accept it without knowing what it is, and the bodyguards then leave sensing that Swari is close by. Swari then comes there, and she introduces herself to Hulami, and she asks her help in something. Hulami then asks Swari to stop bowing, and she states that she will think about it after she tells her the reason. Swari then explains that soon influential merchant families will gather, and a party will be held to unveil their magic items and engineers. Hulami understands, and Swari states that the one who planned this gathering is a girl named Kaneshi. She is from a rival merchant family, and she can't stand her. Hulami then thinks that being rich must also be tough, and she states that she will be willing to do it as it sounds fun, and Boxo also agrees. The scene then cuts to them all at the party, and Boxo looks for the girl that Swari was talking about, and he locates her. He thinks that she pulls off the rich girl look much better than Swari, and Swari then goes to talk to Kaneshi. They greet each other, and Kaneshi states that Swari doesn't need to put herself out, and she can just sit quiet and enviously watch the proceedings. Swari mentions that Kaneshi doesn't need to try too hard as it would pain her to see her heart stop from how shocked she is going to be. Hearing this Boxo thinks that this is too harsh to be children's conversation and Kaneshi then notices Swari's magic engineer and Swari states Kaneshi's magic engineer won't be able to hold a candle to hers. Kaneshi states that Swari should put on her bravest face while she can and she mentions that she will turn her smile into a frown soon enough. Swari then thinks that Kaneshi really pisses her off and the showing of magic items then begin. Hulami and everyone else in the party are bored by the mediocre magical items presented by the others, and finally it's Kaneshi's turn. Hulami wonders what Kaneshi has for them, and we then see that Kaneshi's creation is a robot, and it obeys any commands that's given to it. Kaneshi's magic engineer mentions that an intelligent magic item has always been the dream of engineers, and he has achieved it. Hulami then reminds Boxo that the technology for endowing magical items with intelligence hasn't been discovered yet, and it's not possible unless somebody's soul is put inside it. But that is a dangerous act, and it's prohibited by the Magic Item Engineers Association. A foolish engineer once broke that rule, and he destroyed a whole town. Kaneshi's magic item then malfunctions, and it begins to speak. Hulami thinks that the worst-case scenario is happening, and Kaneshi's engineer thinks that he didn't equip this thing with speech. He tries to shut it off, but the magic item doesn't let him do this. Hulami then mentions that the engineer must have forced a human soul inside the magic item, and she asks Swari's guards to pin down the magic item. The guards fail to do so, and Hulami then uses a distraction to get behind the magic item, and she shuts it off, and releases the soul inside of it. She then mentions that the soul can truly rest in peace this time, and the engineer mentions that he had to do research for years to come with this technique, and he can't believe that Hulami deactivated it so quickly. Hulami then states that it was easy with her on the job, and rest of the attendants at the party then recognize Hulami as the child who caused various problems through her experiments in her younger days. Hulami asks them to stop talking about her younger days, and Swari then tells Kaneshi that it looks like she won this time. Boxo then thinks that this was troublesome, but due to the safe resolution he can consider this request a success, and the only problem is that everyone has forgotten about him. The scene then cuts to Winter coming to the Clear Lake Stratum, and we see that an ominous meeting is taking place somewhere. The attendees state that they never thought that their reach would extend this far, and they mention that they have taken possession of 70% of the strata where that's been released, and now they have come to the Clear Lake Stratum. They think that they need countermeasures for this, and they mention that it's time to eliminate the chain restaurant, the worst threat they have ever faced. 
Manami states that this is why she has invited a special guest to their meeting as a secret weapon, and Boxo then says hello to the group. He thinks that based on what he just heard, a big-time restaurant chain called The Chain Restaurant is coming to the village, and the local restaurants are in danger of going out of business. The attendees then wonder how they are going to get through the winter like this, and Boxo thinks that he must have been invited here so he could come up with a way to deal with this situation. Manami then states that she will let Lammies stay at the inn at half price when the inn is back up and running if Boxo helps them, and hearing this Boxo agrees to help them. Boxo then thinks that this is a big responsibility, and he thinks that he will have to get Lammies and Hulami to help him. The scene then cuts to Lammies, Hulami, and Boxo going to the chain restaurant the next day, and Hulami mentions that she has heard of them, and she can't believe that they have now set up shop in this stratum as well. The owner of the restaurant then confronts them, and he wonders if they are here to scout out the competition. He then notices Boxo, and he mentions that this must be the magic item with a mind of its own. He asks Boxo if he would like to work for them, and Lammies mentions that Boxo would never work in a place like this, because he is always with her. The owner thinks that this is bad, and he mentions that they don't need him anyways as they will be raking it in, in several months time. He then leaves, and the scene cuts to the girls trying the food of the restaurant. They think that it tastes average, and they mention that it must be because they are used to Boxo's food. Lamis thinks that the flavors are weak, and Boxo thinks that this makes sense as seasonings must be quite pricey in this world, and he thinks that he has found a way to defeat them. The restaurant owners of the Clear Lake Stratum then hold another meeting, and Manami states that now is their only chance to win as the chain's restaurant is holding their opening sale. She mentions that they must firmly grab their customers by their stomach to prevent themselves from losing them, and she mentions that they will need to develop a new menu for this. Everyone then presents their trial menu items, and Manami asks Boxo to try them. Boxo thinks that he can't sample them, and Lamis mentions that Hulami and her will try it and let Boxo know how it tastes. The girls then try it, and they think that the pasta is good, but the flavor is weak. Hearing this Boxo gives Manami some of the pasta he has, and Manami thinks that it's great, and eating this she finds out what improvements her dish needs. The others then ask Boxo to teach them as well, and Boxo gives them each a dish, from which they learn new techniques, and they decide their menu. The next day the restaurant owners set up stalls around the chain restaurant, and they try to sell their new dishes. Hulami hopes that they can take back the customers that drifted to the chain restaurant, and we see that the customers of the chain restaurant are going over to the stalls as the line at the restaurant is too long. The customers at the stalls like the new and peculiar type of foods that the stalls are serving, and they think that this is better than the chains. The owner of the chains then comes there, and he realizes that this is where his customers went. He thinks that this must be Boxo's doing, and he then leaves telling Boxo that he will make him pay. The shop set up by Manami and the others then flourished, and a month later the chain's restaurant withdrew completely from the Clear Lake Stratum. Carry Oil then comes there, and he mentions that he would like to talk to Boxo about something. He asks Boxo if he would like to go on a campaign with the menagerie when winter is over and Boxo refuses. Carry Oil can't believe that he has been rejected again, and he mentions that Boxo should be kind to his regular customers. He then reminds him that he did volunteer to rescue him, and Boxo thinks that with the menagerie helping them out, the gang of thieves never stood a chance against them. Boxo then thanks Carry Oil, and Carry Oil states that he would like for them to think about his offer, and he leaves. At night Hulami tells Lamis that people would normally be happy to accompany the menagerie of fools as they are quite well known. Lamis then states that she wants to fight as she won't be any stronger if she doesn't, and Hulami wonders if she wants to get revenge. She then states that it doesn't matter, and she mentions that Lamis also has a dependable partner now. Boxo then thinks that Lamis has been keeping all this pain inside of her for all this time, and he thinks that he can't say anything to her, but there is something he can do for her. Boxo then gives Lamis a flower, and Lamis states that she will treasure it. Boxo then mentions that in the language of flower the pink carnation means gratitude. The story continues, and Boxo remembers what Hulami told him about Lamis's village being attacked by monsters, and he thinks that he didn't know that Lamis was harboring such a bitter memory. He thinks that the hunters will become active again once spring arrives, and he thinks that he is going to protect Lamis the next time around. A girl then comes to Boxo, and seeing the guards come towards her, she hides behind Boxo. The bald guard then buys Odin, and his companion states that he really likes that stewed stuff. 
The bald guard states that this is his favorite, and the story then goes back in time, and we see that the bald guy and the girl met before at a store, and the bald guy states that he was just going to head to the girl's shop. The girl states that she was also on her way to there, and she mentions that the bald guy's scarf has a pretty color. The bald guy mentions that he likes red, and his companion states that he should help the girl carry her stuff. At present the girl thinks that all she can do is see him walk away even though she is wearing his favorite color, and Boxo then changes forms. He gives the girl some vegetables, and he gives her some other ingredients, and the girl wonders what she is supposed to do with these. Boxo then gives the girl Odin, and the girl realizes that Boxo wants her to stew these ingredients together. The girl then thanks Boxo, and she mentions that she can surely get his attention with this. The scene then cuts to the bald guy telling Boxo that love is the best, and everything sparkles when you are in love. He mentions that the girl cooked for him yesterday as well, and we find out that they have hooked up. This makes Boxo jealous, and he then gives the bald guard some hot Odin which burns his hand. The scene then cuts to the days becoming hotter and Lammy's and Hulami then buy some soda. Lammy's tells Boxo that they will be heading out tomorrow with the menagerie of fools, and she mentions that they are going to go check on the crocodile fiends. Hulami explains that the crocodile fiends are one of the three big factions in the Clearflow Lake Stratum, and Lammy states that they did defeat the frog fiends and the two-headed snakes, so they are going to check if the crocodile fiends have over-multiplied. But culling them will have to wait, and Hulami thinks that not looking into it would be dangerous. She mentions that King Frog Fiend and a giant two-headed snake appeared recently, and something strange might be going on in this stratum. Hulami then tells Lammy's to be careful, and Lammy states that she will run away with Boxo if she gets into danger. The scene then cuts to Lammy's leaving for her expedition with Boxo and the menagerie, and the guards tell them to be careful. Carrie Oil then states that it's time to leave, and he tells Lammy's to get into the carriage. Lammy states that she will just walk as it's good training, and Hulami states that she would be happy to take her place. Lammy's wonders if Hulami is also coming with them, and Hulami states that it's an ecological survey so they should have someone well informed with them. She states that the director himself hired her to go, and Boxo wonders if she kept this under wraps just to surprise them. The scene then cuts to the menagerie, and the others on their way, and they think that they should take a break soon. Carrie Oil then notices some frog fiends around them, and the menagerie begins to fight the frog fiends. Lammy's thinks that she should do something as well, and she wonders if she should throw some rocks. Boxo thinks that throwing would put Lammy's strength to good use, and he gives Lammy some soda in a glass bottle to throw. Lammy's throws it, but unfortunately, it doesn't hit the targets. The scene then cuts to the menagerie taking a break, and they eat Boxo's food. Filmina thinks that they won't have to worry about running out of food on their campaign thanks to Boxo, and the boys are glad that they won't have to catch and eat monsters in this campaign. Hulami then tries to leave to go somewhere, but Boxo changes forms and Hulami notices that Boxo has a new type of box on his side. Inside the box, they find a foldable chair, a plastic bag, and some kind of small tent. They put the whole thing together, and Hulami wonders if this is a toilet. Hulami thinks that this way no one will be able to see them, and if they close the bag once they are done, the stink won't get out. Filmina thinks that this is a big help, and Carrie Oil mentions that it's because he talked Boxo into coming with them that they can use these conveniences. He states that they should sing his praises, and Filmina mentions that he won't get credit on account of Boxo being impressive. The menagerie then resumes their travels, and Carrie Oil mentions that they should be on their guard as they are entering the monster's territory. Carrie Oil then tells Eka and Shiro to go scouting, and Boxo thinks that he didn't peg these guys to be the ones to handle recon. Eka and Shiro then go for recon, and Boxo thinks that this goes to show that they shouldn't judge people by appearances. The others relax while Eka and Shiro are doing recon, and in the evening Eka and Shiro return. They then tell the group that two hours north of here there is a small marsh with around 30 crocodile fiends. Hulami thinks that 30 means that they are a mid-sized group, and she wonders how tall they were. Eka and Shiro mentioned that they were about as tall as them on their hind legs, and Hilami thinks that this is smaller than usual, and she wonders if they are short on food since they can't attack the frog fiends because of the recent appearance of the king frog fiend. Carrie Oil mentions that they should just leave them be as it's not a big group, and Filmina reminds Carrie Oil that crocodile fiends are carnivorous, and if left alone they will attack the humans to satisfy their hunger. 
Carrie Oil mentions that this job only involves gathering information so they shouldn't go after them, and Philmina mentions that crocodile fiend material fetches a high price, so they should attack when the monsters are weakened. Aka and Shiro think that the vice captain changes completely when money is involved, and Carrie Oil then mentions that they will put the fiends down. Hulami states that they should attack in the morning if they are going to fight them, as crocodile fiends are nocturnal creatures. Carry Oil then tells his party to rest up, and the scene cuts to them sleeping. Hulami then tells Lamis to not overdo things, and she asks Boxo to protect Lamis if something goes wrong. Boxo states that he will, and Hulami wonders if there is a way she can help as well. Boxo then transforms into an ice vending machine, and the girls notice the ice. Hulami realizes that Boxo wants them to use the ice for the hunt, and she thinks that this is going to be interesting. The scene then cuts to Boxo dispersing a lot of ice into the river where the crocodile fiends are, and Aka and Shiro then inform the others that the crocodile fiends have come ashore due to the cold water. Carry Oil then asks Filmina if she can obstruct the crocodile fiends' view with fog magic, and Filmina mentions that covering the entire marsh with fog will be difficult. Boxo then transforms into another type of vending machine, and he starts to disperse steam. Filmina thinks that combined with her magic they can cover this entire swamp with fog, and Carriol thinks that he chose the right magic item for their party. Filmina then states that Boxo seems to be more useful than their captain, and this makes Carriol depressed. Filmina then asks Carriol to stop moping around and give them their orders, and Carriol tells his party to just go and pick them off one by one. Lamis then notices that Boxo is still producing steam, and she states that she will leave Boxo with Hulami, and she goes with the rest of the group to attack the crocodile fiends. Hulami then states that she wants to talk to Boxo for a bit, and she mentions that the director actually gave her the job to go and find out why things are awry in the Clearflow Lake Stratum. She mentions that each of the stratums in the dungeon has an entity called the Floor Boss, and it appears on rare occasions but nobody knows what triggers it. It takes years, and sometimes even decades for it to spawn, and Boxo thinks that she must be talking about the boss-level monsters that are often seen on each level of the dungeon. Hulami mentions that the director thinks that these disturbances might mean the revival of the Lord, and according to a rumor they can get a rare treasure if they can defeat a boss. Hulami then hears a strange sound, and she notices the menagerie running away from the floor boss. She notices that the boss is also causing stratum splits, and Carriwell then tells Hulami to grab his hand. Hulami doesn't want to leave Boxo behind, but Boxo activates his barrier, and he pushes Hulami onto the cart. Boxo then changes his form, and he attracts the boss towards him. He increases his durability and toughness, and the boss then tackles Boxo. This makes Boxo lose a thousand points, and Boxo thinks that this must be what happens when he is hit with an attack more powerful than the barrier. Boxo then thinks that he can't let the boss go after the group, and he then uses the barrier to expel some fried chicken and the boss takes the bait. Boxo then expels a lot of fried chicken but the boss eats Boxo along with the chicken. The scene cuts to Boxo waking up in the boss's stomach, and he notices that his points are being used up really fast. He thinks that he needs to do something fast, and he uses some drugs to make the boss's stomach upset. He thinks that this won't be enough to stop it, and he then turns into a gas vending machine to release some gas into its stomach. Boxo then turns into a vending machine with a microwave function, and replenishes some canned soup, towel, and a newspaper in the microwave. He heats them up, and the items catch fire, and he expels them into the boss's stomach making a big explosion. The others notice the explosion, and they wonder what that was. Boxo then notices that he has defeated the boss, and he gets some sort of coin for defeating it. He thinks that this must be the treasure that Hulami was talking about, and he then lets it inside his barrier. A stratum split then happens in the place where Boxo is, and Boxo falls into a deep pit. The story continues with Boxo falling into a stratum split, and he then turns into a balloon vending machine. He tries to inflate some balloon, but the machine is too slow, and he uses 10,000 points to increase his speed. Boxo then inflates a lot of balloons, but the speed of his fall still doesn't slow down. Boxo then turns into a cardboard vending machine, and due to the light way of the cardboard his speed of descent slows down. Boxo then notices something, and he remembers that Hulami told him that there is a giant labyrinth below the clear lake stratum. He thinks that this is a complicated maze, and he uses his security camera to take some shots of the labyrinth thinking that it might come in handy later. 
Boxo then lands onto the ground, and he notices that he has dropped the coin he got after defeating the floor boss. He thinks that he can't pick it up, and he wonders if he can use some new function to do this. Boxo then notices that he has a million points, and he wonders if it's because he defeated the floor boss. He thinks that he might also get points for beating enemies, and he wonders what function he can add with a million points. He then notices a vending machine rank up function, and he chooses it to increase his vending machine rank to 2. This unlocks various new stats including strength, dexterity, magic, and Boxo finds out that now he can turn into anything that adheres to the definition of vending machine. Boxo then transforms into a coin-up vacuum cleaner, and he uses his vacuum to acquire the floor boss coin. He then wonders what this coin can do, and the system sound tells him that this coin is the proof that Boxo has defeated the floor boss of Clearflow Lake Stratum. He thinks that there is no harm in keeping it, and a system sound then alerts him that the transformation time for today is about to exceed two hours, and he has to turn back to his original form. Boxo turns back to his original form, and he thinks that he didn't know that he has a transformation limit. Afterwards Boxo thinks that not a single person has come by since then, but he is not worried as he has added the solar panel function, and now he can save his operational points on sunny days. Boxo then notices some bearcats running away from some monsters, and we see that one of the bearcats is injured, and the whole group is slowing down because of her, as they don't want to leave her behind. Boxo then uses his stealth function, and he then uses his barrier to push out some milk bottles to hit the monsters. The monster run away injured, and Boxo thinks that those bearcats were adorable. The bearcats then stop, seeing that the monsters have stopped chasing them, and Boxo then disables his stealth function. The bearcats notice Boxo, and they wonder if this thing was here when they came through before. Boxo then says hello, and this startles the bearcats, and they run away from Boxo. Boxo thinks that he must have scared them, and he then changes his form, and he gives the bearcats some fried chicken. Boxo then tells them to insert coins, and the female bearcat thinks that this must be a box which sells things. Their leader states that they have to be careful as it might be using goods as a trap. But the other bearcats can't hold themselves back after seeing delectable fried chicken in front of them, and Boxo thinks that he has figured out their names now. Pell then tries some fried chicken, and he thinks that this was good. Suko thinks that she is also going to eat some, and she uses a silver coin to buy some fried chicken. Suko and Short then also eat the chicken, and they think that it's great. Pell also joins them, and McCann states as their leader it's his duty to check if this has poison in it. McCann also likes the chicken, and from their conversation Boxo finds out that these bearcats are a group of hunters called the Voracious Devils, and for some reason their living expenses are high. They have come to this stratum in hopes of getting rich quick, and Boxo thinks that he can understand why their living expenses are high. McCann then mentions that they should get out of this stratum now, and Suko states that they can't as they haven't gotten any treasure yet. McCann mentions that they have already found a treasure, and Boxo thinks that he doesn't mind being called a treasure, but he is not anyone's property. He thinks that he already has Lammies as a partner, and Boxo then says too bad. This startles the Bearcats, and they can't believe that Boxo can say more than a single phrase. Boxo then says everything that he can speak, and Pell wonders if Boxo was reacting to their voices just now. McKen mentions that this box might be able to understand what they are saying, and it might have a mind of its own, and Boxo says hello there. McKen then thinks that maybe he was wrong, as it's responding with whatever. Boxo thinks that they should think more, and he thinks that he can only say certain phrases. Suko then thinks the same thing as McKen, and McKen then states that since they found this magic item, they should bring it back with them, and they try to lift Boxo, but they can't even make him budge. Boxo thinks that he can transform into a cardboard vending machine to make himself lighter, but this might make the Bearcats scared of him again. Boxo then installs some wheels on himself, and the Bearcats think that they can move it now. Suko thinks that now they can eat any time they want, and Short mentions that they might be able to make a fortune if they sell it to some place like the chain restaurant. Boxo thinks that he has no intention of being sold, and the Bearcats then remember that it was around this place that they encountered those huge hog fiends, and Boxo thinks that he should let them know about his barrier. Boxo then traps Pell and Short in his barrier, and they are anxious at not being able to get out of it. McKen and Suko try to help them out, but they can't get in either. Boxo then expels Short and Pell out of the barrier, and he thinks that he might have made them wary of him by doing this. 
The Bearcats then wonder if Boxo was messing with them, and Boxo thinks that he has to find a new way to communicate. He thinks that he will try a new function, and he then tries to use a display to convey his message, but he finds out that the display can only show phrases that he can speak himself. The Bearcats wonder what these pictures floating above are, and McKen thinks that they might be some kind of letters, but he has never seen them before. Boxo thinks that they can't read this because it's Japanese, and the Bearcats wonder if the magic item box has rejected them. Boxo thinks that they got it all wrong, and he thinks that this is really frustrating. Boxo then gives the Bearcats some fried chicken, and after eating it they think that a box which makes food this good can't be a bad guy. Boxo can't believe that food is all it takes to convince these guys, and some huge hog fiends then come there. Boxo turns into a kerosene pump to deal with them, and he uses some kerosene to make the huge hog fiends slip. The ground then starts to shake, and Boxo notices a flame skeleton. The Bearcats wonder what the floor boss is doing here, and they run away with Boxo. The flame skeleton then eats the huge hog fiends, and it goes away. McKen then states that they didn't expect the floor boss to show up, and Short mentions that he has heard that they can get a treasure if they defeat the flame skeleton. The day then turns into night, and the Bearcats are sleeping. Boxo thinks that he has a bunch of misgivings about this group, and he then notices something heading their way. He thinks that he should alert the Bearcats, and he tries to wake them up, but they are in deep sleep. Boxo tries again, and the Bearcats wake up. McKen notices that some flame skulls are heading their way, and he thinks that they have to deal with them or they will summon the flame skeleton. Boxo then gives them some water bottles, and they use the water to put out the flame, and they defeat the flame skulls. Seeing this Boxo thinks that they might be a capable group after all, and McKen mentions that they should keep a water bottle handy as they might get attacked again. Pell then states that this magic box is amazing as it gives them exactly what they want, and it's like it has a mind of its own. Boxo thinks that they might be able to understand each other now, and he says hello there. McKen states that it's still saying random phrases, so Pell must be wrong. The next day while the Bearcats are roaming around with Boxo they hear some fighting noises, and Suko mentions that it sounds like there are a bunch of them. Short states that he will go take a quick look, and he notices that Director Bear is here, and they should meet him. Boxo thinks that he is saved if the director is here, and Short then mentions that one of the hunters he has with him is amazing, but she keeps saying nonsense like Boxo. She shattered a bunch of rock fiends with her kicks and punches, and Pell states that no human can defeat rock fiends using their bare hands. Short mentions that she said that she was worried about this Boxo guy, and she said that she would nail him with a solid hit if she can find him. We then see that Lammy's is here, and she notices Boxo. She gives him a hug and the rest of the group then meet up as well. Hulami states that she was confident that Boxo would be okay, and Boxo can't believe that everyone was worried about him. Shiro and Eka then mentioned that this was a close call, and Boxo wonders what they mean. Filmina states that Lamis was mad at them for abandoning Boxo, and who knows what would have happened to them if they didn't find Boxo in time. The Bearcats then mentioned that it's been a while since they saw the director, and the director commends them for finding and looking after Boxo. The Bearcats then wonder what Boxo is, and the director states that this magic item is named Boxo. He is a resident of the Clearflow Lake Stratum, and he is also capable of understanding them. The Bearcats can't believe this, as Boxo only says random things, and Lamis explains that Boxo can only say certain things, and hello there means yes, and too bad means no. The Bearcats then test if this is true, and they are surprised to find out that Boxo could understand them this entire time. The story continues, and the director tells Boxo that their goal this time around was to find him, but they also had another goal in mind. He mentions that this is a request from the Menagerie of Fools, and it's to defeat the Flame Skeleton floor boss. He mentions that they originally weren't considering defeating it, but it does present a problem for the other hunters if left unchecked. So, they are going to try to take it down, as it is his duty as the director of the Hunters Association. He states that the menagerie will explain the rest, and Carry Oil states that they want to defeat the Stratum Lord, and for this they want Boxo's help. He mentions that this must be a lot to take in, and he states that he will explain it a little further. He then mentions that everyone in the menagerie has a goal, and they have resolved to do whatever it takes to accomplish that goal. Carryoil then explains that according to legends, whoever reaches the lowest level of the dungeon and meets the requirements can have any wish granted. 
He states that there have been people who have reached the lowest level, but no one has conquered it yet, and they don't even know what the requirements are, but this is the goal of their party. Carry Oil explains that according to rumors, for each wish you want granted, you need one of those floor boss coins, and Boxo thinks that he didn't know that those coins are that valuable. Carry Oil states that the menagerie has eight members, but him and the vice captain have the same wish, and the twins also have the same wish, therefore they need six coins in total. He states that they currently have three coins, and Boxo thinks that he can also have a wish granted if he uses a coin. Carry Oil then states that he has heard that Boxo has a human soul inside and if he works with them then he can return to being a human. Lamis wonders if this is true, and Hulami states that she has read it in a book before. Carry Oil mentions that they will have to reach the lowest level first, and he states that they are currently developing their abilities by going to different stratums and defeating the floor boss there. He then asks Boxo if he saw a floor boss coin when he defeated the crocodile, and Boxo states that he did. Carry Oil thinks that this is great, and he asks Lamis and Boxo to join the menagerie. Lamis states that she wants to talk to Boxo and have him taste her cooking, so she will help them out. Hulami mentions that she will also work with them, and Boxo agrees to help them out as well. At night Boxo wonders about going back to being a human, and the next day the director shows everyone a map to plan their next move. Boxo thinks that this map is not completely accurate and he then uses a new function to install a display screen, and he shows everyone the photos he took of this stratum. Hulami wonders if Boxo was able to show them things that he has seen himself, and Boxo states that he can. Filmina then draws the new map, and the director then tells everyone the plan to defeat the floor boss. He mentions that there is a trap on this path up ahead, and it only activates when anything above a set weight stumbles upon it, and it opens a large hole beneath them. He mentions that that they will drop the flame skeleton into the hole, as the hole is big enough to contain it. Hulami states that it seems unlikely that a floor boss would walk in on a trap in his own stratum, and the director states that this is why they are going to activate the trap manually. Carry Oil mentions that this is why the group this time is about quality, and not quantity, and Boxo thinks that this must be why the guards Karyos and Gorth are here. They then reach the trap, and the director tells everyone to have their backs against the left wall. He then activates the trap, and he tells them to remember its placement. Carry Oil then explains the plan, and he mentions that they are going to lure the flame skeleton into the pitfall, but this will not be enough to finish it off. He states that they will have to put out its fire first, so they are going to use the vice president's water magic and boxo to fill the hold with water beforehand, and then they can inflict damage on the flame skeleton. Carry Oil then asks boxo if it's possible for him to discharge large amounts of water, and Boxo thinks that he can dispense bottle water, but that would take too long. He thinks that he will have to add another function, and he turns into a power washer. Seeing the instructions on the machine Hulami figure out how to use it, and she tries it out by dispensing some water. Carry Oil thinks that this plan will work out with this much water, and Boxo thinks that this is good, but they have a problem since he can only change forms for two hours a day. Two days then pass by, and Boxo has been turning into a power washer for an hour every day, and at other times he gives them bottles to fill the hole with water. During this time some monsters have attacked them, but their party is more than capable of handling them with ease. McKenna goes into the hole to check how much water has filled up, and he thinks that it's cold inside the hole. He then finds out that the hole is completely empty as it has a good drainage system. Carry Oil then thinks that they will have to rethink their plan, and Boxo then turns into an ice vending machine. Carry Oil thinks that they can dump ice inside the hole as it's cold down there, and Boxo then dispenses ice in the hole. He wonders if ice is going to be enough to stop a floor boss, and at night Boxo makes something else as well. Lamis wonders if Boxo is thinking about something, and Boxo wonders how Lamis knows this. Lamis states that Boxo's light flickers whenever he is thinking, and she then asks Boxo if he wants to be human again. Boxo thinks that he wanted to be a human again at first, but he then thought that he wouldn't be worth anything if he wasn't a vending machine. He thinks that everyone would be happy at first, but soon they will be disappointed at how useless he is. Boxo then tells Lamis both yes and no, and Lamis figures out that he is unsure about it. Lamy states that she would like to talk to him someday and do all sorts of things, and Boxo thinks that he will be able to walk side by side with Lamy's if he becomes a human again, and he thinks that maybe that alone would be enough. Several more days then pass by, 
and by now a lot of ice has been collected into the hole, and they think that now is the time to put their plan in motion. Hulami asks Boxo if their plan is going to work, and Boxo states that it will. The flame skeleton then shows up there, and they manage to make it fall into the hole. Hulami tells everyone to brace themselves as steam will come gushing out of the hole, but this doesn't happen. Hulami wonders what's going on, and McKen states that the skeleton's fire has gone out. Hulami wonders how this happened, and Boxo thinks that he is the only one who knows the answer to that. He explains that it wasn't ice that he was dumping into that hole, it was dry ice, and dry ice is solidified carbon dioxide. Fire cannot burn without oxygen, and the carbon dioxide is collected in the bottom as it's heavier than oxygen, and this extinguished the skeleton's flame. Everyone then attacks the skeleton with rocks, and they think that their attacks aren't doing much damage, and they need something heavier to hit it with. They all look towards Boxo, and Carriol thinks that Boxo should be fine as he did come out unscathed after falling through the stratum split. Lamy states that they can't force Boxo into danger, and Carriol agrees, and he says that it would be unfair to put any more burden upon him. Filmina then mentions that they have no choice but to jump into the hole and crush the skeleton, and Boxo thinks that they can't go into the hole as it's full of carbon dioxide, and they will not survive it. Boxo tries to warn the others, but they can't understand him, and he then turns into a pervy magazine vending machine, and Lamy states that now is not the time for this, and she sends Boxo flying, calling him a pervert. Boxo then falls on top of the flame skeleton, and he crushes it completely. Lamy's then calls Boxo reckless, and she states that she will come and get him. Boxo manages to tell them that it's dangerous here, and he then uses the vacuum machine to take the floor boss coin. Boxo then uses balloons in combination with his barrier to fly out of the hole, and McKen closes the hole, and Boxo lands on the ground. Lamy's then gets angry at Boxo, and she asks him what he would do if he broke apart. Hulami tells Lamy's to leave it at that, as Boxo might start to hate her if she criticizes him too much. Lamy's tells Boxo to not do something like this again, but Boxo doesn't give her a reply, and he thinks that he will have to do it again if a situation arises. Carrioil then asks Boxo if he got the floor boss coin, and Boxo shows him the coin. Hulami takes it, and she mentions that this coin belongs to Boxo as he is the one who defeated the flame skeleton. Carrioil then mentions that he will buy the coin from Boxo, and he states that he will give him a hundred gold coins for it. The director mentions that this is the going rate for a floor boss coin, and Hulami asks Boxo what he wants to do. Boxo thinks that he already has a floor boss coin, and he doesn't need any more of them so he agrees to sell the coin to Carrioil. Carrioil states that he will pay Boxo another day, and he takes the coin, and they then head back home. On the way Boxo thinks that he probably won't be coming back to this stratum again, as the sky, and these narrow avenues are all he can see here, and he has had enough of those. The story continues, and Boxo mentions that they met with no trouble after conquering the labyrinth stratum lord, and two days later, they got out of the labyrinth. They notice a village out there, and they notice that it seems desolate, and Shuei mentions that there are only facilities which the hunters would need. Lamis wonders how they protect themselves against monsters, as there is no wall surrounding the village, and Filmina mentions that monsters don't attack outside the labyrinth. The director then states that many areas of the dungeon are still a mystery to them, and the sudden resurgence of so many floor bosses is also a mystery. They then enter the hunters' association, and the director tells the workers there that he knows that it's boring here but they shouldn't make it so obvious. The director then tells everyone to take it easy today, as they have worked hard, and at night everyone finally sleeps with a roof on their head. The next morning the menagerie of fools leave the stratum with the director, and Lamis and Hulami stay behind with Boxo to survey the perimeter of the giant labyrinth. A hot guy then comes to the hunter's guild, and he introduces himself as Mishel. He asks the receptionists if they have a detailed map of this floor, and Lamis thinks that this guy is the image of perfection, and the receptionists are also taken in by his looks. They mention that Michel will have to wait for three days to get a detailed map, and Michel then leaves saying that he will return another time. Lamis then mentions that this guy looked like the hero from the old tale, and Hulami mentions that the old tales are romanticized too much, and most powerful adventurers are middle-aged men with muscles. Lamis then wonders what Hulami thinks about the adventurer, she of the divine favor his people said that she was really beautiful, and Hulami mentions that the records does say that she was beautiful, and she states that the looker they saw right now must be one of those special cases. 
She mentions that he must be good if he is challenging the labyrinth stratum on his own, and at night Michel comes out of the inn, and he states that he came to this place because he heard that there aren't many people in this floor. He thinks that he is really nervous around people, and he wonders why everyone keeps staring at him. Boxo wonders if this is the real him, and Michel states that he hates talking to people. Boxo realizes that Michel is bad at communicating, and this is why he has assumed this haughty persona. Boxo then thinks that he can relate with him, and he thinks that he wants to help him, and he remembers that cacao pods can help people relax. Boxo then says hello to Michel, and he tells him to buy some gentle cacao. Michel drinks the cacao, and he thinks that it's sweet and delicious, and it's helping him relax. Michel then thinks that this is an amazing magic item, and since he is not dealing with a person, buying things isn't nerve-wracking. He mentions that it's negotiation time tomorrow, and the next day we find out that Michel is going to join Lamy's and the others on their mission. On their way Lamy's asks Michel if he was planning to travel through the inside of the labyrinth, and Michel states that it's true. Hulami mentions that it's no problem as they did get a capable hunter, and the Bearcats mention that it's an honor to work with the aloof Black Flash, and Michel states that it's true. Boxo then thinks that Michel should work on changing his responses, and Lamy's wonders how long it will take them to make a round of the labyrinth. Hulami states that according to the images she saw it should take them less than three weeks, and Michel mentions that it's true, and he then states that he will go to the rear to act as the rear guard. Michel then thinks that this month he has to learn how to be as natural as possible around unfamiliar people, and Boxo thinks that Michel might be trying to improve his communication issues by being in this group. At night everyone sleeps, and Michel thinks that he was really nervous today. He thinks that the band of gluttons and the girls are so cute, and all he could do was keep his face neutral. He thinks that everyone said that they would be fine with Boxo on watch, and he wonders if this magic item really has a mind of its own. Boxo then says hello, and Michel buys some cacao from him. He thinks that shopping usually stresses him out, but it's easy with Boxo around. A week then passes by with no incident whatsoever, but today something seems amiss with Lamy's. Hulami asks Lamy's what's wrong, and Lamy states that it's nothing. Michel then mentions that Lamy shouldn't overexert herself, and Lamy's then collapses, and Michel catches her. He then asks Hulami to look after her in the cart, and Hulami states that they will have to change her clothes. Lamy's tries to deny her, but Hulami states that Lamy's has to accept others' kindness, and rest at times like these. Boxo then thinks that Lamy's always has an off day once around every month, and he apologizes for not noticing it sooner. Ken wonders what's going on with Lamy's, and Suko states that she has heard that among humans the females bleed from down there once a month. Boxo then wonders what he can do, and he changes his form, and he gives Hulami a pad. Hulami wonders what this is, and she finds out that it can absorb water, and she realizes how to use it. Boxo then turns into a washing machine, and Hulami figures out what to do by seeing the images printed on it, and she washes Lamy's clothes. Boxo then states that it's been two weeks since they set out on their survey, and by Hulami's calculations they should be able to reach the village on this floor in the next three days. He mentions that after that thing with Lamy's Michel started eating with everyone, and he seems to have better adjusted. Michel then states that Boxo seems like a useful magic item, and Lamy's mentions that his foods taste good, and he also has tons of useful tools. Hulami states that there are no written records of any other item like Boxo, and Pell then smells someone up ahead, and they all stop. Pell mentions that there are five humans up ahead, and Hulami thinks that there shouldn't be any hunters out in a place like this. Michel then states that there is a chance that they are after him, and he mentions that he doesn't wish to cause any more trouble for them so he will be going alone. Lamy states that they can't let him go alone as it's dangerous, and Michel states that he can't let them come with him. Hulami asks him why they are after him, and Michel stays silent, and Boxo thinks that seeing Michel's secretiveness this seems like trouble. Lamy's then mentions that Michel doesn't need to worry about them as they have Boxo on their side, and Boxo then uses his barrier. Michel wonders what this blue light is, and Lamy states that it's a barrier. Hulami wonders if Michel will agree to let them come along with him, if his attacks don't get through Boxo's barrier, and Michel promises them that he will. Michel then attacks Boxo with a powerful strike, and Boxo manages to block it, but it costs him 500 points. Boxo can't believe that Michel's attack was this powerful, and Lamy's then states that Michel doesn't need to worry about them as they are going to be fine.
Michelle understands, and Lamy's, Boxo, and McCann then venture ahead with Michelle, and Michelle states that he can sense three swordsmen and two mages up ahead. Lamy's can't believe that Michelle can sense them from this far out, and they then come across the people in question. The leader of the group tells Michelle that they are here to take his life, and Michelle wonders who they work for. They mention that Michelle should know this already, and the man asks if the beast person and the girl are also with Michelle. Michelle states that they are not, and he mentions that he is just doing a mission with them, and he asks them to not harm them. The man states that he won't harm them if Michelle comes with them quietly, and Michelle states that he can't believe that, and he mentions that he will keep them safe by keeping them from harming them. The groups then begin to fight, and they split up. Boxo turns into a car washer, and Lamis uses the water from the hose to attack the mages after her. Boxo then dispenses some shampoo, and the shampoo gets in the eyes of the mages, and Lamis, and McCann then defeat them. We see that Michelle has also defeated two of the three warriors, and he then takes out their leader as well. Michelle then thanks the others for helping him out, and he asks them to go get Hulami and the others, and he states that he needs to extract information from these guys. Lamis and McCann then leave to get the others, and Lamis thinks that Michelle has a lot going on. She thinks that she is not sure how deep she should get into this thing, and Boxo agrees with her. The scene then cuts to them all gathering together, and Michelle then apologizes for getting them involved. Lamis tells him to not worry about it as Boxo gets him involved all the time, and Michelle mentions that he can't reveal any details, but his life is being targeted for some reason, and he doesn't want to put their lives in danger any further so he will transfer to another stratum. Lamis then states that Michelle should join the menagerie of fools as he is a powerful guy, and she mentions that their captain is looking for guys like him. Hulami states that it's true, and she mentions that the captain wouldn't even care about his past as long as he is strong. Michelle states that he has heard of the menagerie, and Lamis mentions that they work with them sometimes. Michelle then states that he will try to contact them, and he hopes that they can meet again, and he leaves. Michelle then wonders if he can handle being in a party of unfamiliar people, and the scene then cuts to Boxo and the others at the Clearflow Lake Stratum. They find out that someone has been doing business here with Boxo's name, and they notice that someone has set up a fake vending machine around the chain restaurant. They find out that it's the people from the chain restaurant by the taste of their food, but their business shuts down as soon as Boxo starts selling his items in the Clearflow Lake Stratum once more. The story continues, and Monami states that she is thinking about holding an eating contest. She mentions that in two weeks' time the damage to their outer wall will be fixed, and once safety is ensured more and more people will likely come here. So, under the guise of celebrating the completion of the wall the restaurant union will hold an event. The other restaurant owners think that it's a good idea since hunters do eat a lot, and they state that people will get even more excited if they have a prize for the winner. They state that they won't be facing a loss if they charge admission fees, and they will serve the most filling foods. Manami then states that they will make leaflets, and get into the spirit of things, and Boxo thinks that there was no need for him to be here. Later the restaurant owners state that they want Boxo's help, and Lamis wonders what they want him to do. Hulami states that she has heard that the preparations for the eating contest are going well, and Manami mentions that it was going well until they found out that the band of gluttons and Shue were entering. Boxo then remembers that all of their appetites are incredible, and the restaurant owners state that they are way into red now. They mention that they can't prepare enough food, and Lamis wonders if Boxo can do something about this. Boxo then gives Lamis a cola, and Hulami states that this drink can be quite filling, and if they provide this along with the food then everyone will eat less. Lamis then wonders if the entrants will complain about using this instead of water, and Hulami states that they will. One of the restaurant owners then mentions that they can sell the cola at a high price in their restaurants until the contest, and on the day of the contest they will make it free, so that everyone would want to drink it. They then ask Boxo to offer the cola at a reasonable price, and Boxo does so, and Monami then hopes that Boxo can help them out if they run into more trouble, and Boxo states that he will. The scene then cuts to the eating contest, and Monami states that since they got more entries than expected she will be dividing the tournament in two blocks. She mentions that the five leaders of each block will advance to the finals, and she states that they have prepared a superb prize for the champion. The contestants of block one then come to the stage, and Monami tells them to finish the fried chicken kept in front of them in the allotted time, and the first five to finish will advance to the finals.
The contest then starts, and we see that everyone is scarfing down the food. They all keep eating, and the band of gluttons and a guy named Gakui finish the food before the time is even up. The block two competitors then come onto the stage, and Boxo notices that even Shirley has entered the contest, but he thinks that she doesn't seem like a big eater. The block two of the contest then begins, and everyone keeps scarfing down the food, and Shuei is the first to finish. Lamis and four others then also finish the food, and Munami then states that the finals will take place in two hours, and she tells them to enjoy the performance of a theatrical troupe until it's time. The theatrical troupe's program then ends, and everyone thinks that they were surprised at the end of the program, and Hulami states that she didn't expect that to happen. The finals of the eating contest then begin, and Boxo plays some music to keep the audience excited. He states that he recently acquired this function, and the contestants then come onto the stage. Manami then states that whoever eats the most in the given time will be the winner, and the contestants then start eating, and they are served a big crepe. Boxo states that he is the one who provided the fruit filling for this, and the others think that this looks delicious. The contestants then eat their fill of the food, and contest then comes down to a duel between Suko and Shuei. In the end Shuei wins the contest, and she is given her reward. She notices that the box she received is empty, and Manami states that the first prize is the chance to use Boxo for a day. Boxo is surprised to hear this, and Manami states that Boxo did mention that he would help them out. Boxo then thinks that he did earn a lot selling the cola, and he did promise Manami, and he agrees to this. The scene then cuts to Shuei showing Boxo to the menagerie of fools, and she mentions that for the entire day to date Boxo belongs to her. Carrioil then mentions that they can go hunting if this is the case, and Shuei states that Boxo is hers, and she is not handing him out. She states that she is going to take him on a date to the origin stratum, and the others yield to her hearing this. Shuei then takes Boxo and Lamis to the origin stratum, and Lamis states that it's been a while since she has been here. She then asks Shuei where they are heading, and Shuei states that Lamis will soon find this out. Shuei then goes to a rundown building, and some kids inside the building welcome her. They wonder if Shuei has presents for them, and the caretaker of the kids also welcomes Shuei. Shuei refers to her as the director, and the director states that they should go inside. Inside the house Shuei tells everyone about Boxo, and she mentions that they can have anything that it has by pushing its buttons. The kids then try the snacks that Boxo has, and Boxo thinks that giving out things for free feels nice. Boxo then turns into the balloon vending machine, and he gives the kids some balloons, and he then turns into a car washer, and the children play with water. The director tells them to keep their wet clothes in a tub, and Boxo then washes the wet clothes of the kids by turning into a washing machine. The director can't believe that Boxo can even do laundry, and she thinks that magic items these days sure are handy. Shuei then mentions that they should take a bath while their clothes are being washed, and the children then notice that there is no water in their bathtub. The director then asks them who was on bath duty today, and two girls admit that it was them, and they mention that they forgot because they were playing with Shuei. The director thanks them for being honest about it, and she mentions that it's important to admit their mistakes and learn from them. She states that they will have to forgo the bath now, as it will take too long to heat the water using firewood. Boxo then turns into a hot spring vending machine, and he fills the bathtub with water. The kids are surprised to see the bathtub filling up so fast, and they think that Boxo is amazing. The children then jump into the tub, and everyone then takes a bath, and they rub each other's back. They all have fun, and the director then thanks Boxo for everything. She mentions that she was concerned about Shuei since she has been so worried recently, but seeing her having fun today was a relief. She asks Boxo to look after Shuei, and the scene then cuts to everyone eating food given by Boxo at night. Boxo thinks that he should also provide the kids with some underwear and t-shirts, and he wonders if he is just teaching them that it's good to accept handouts. He thinks that he is never sure how involved he should get with things like these, and Lamis then wonders if Boxo was thinking about something. Boxo thinks that according to Lamis his light apparently flickers when he is thinking, and Lamis states that Boxo should have more confidence in himself. She mentions that he is the one who gave delicious food to these kids, and put smiles on their faces, and Boxo thinks that Lamis is amazing for understanding when a vending machine is thinking something. He thinks that he is glad that Lamis was the one who found him, and after lunch Shuei comes to Boxo and she mentions that Boxo did a lot of work today, and she states that she is grateful for that. 
She mentions that today must have been expensive for Boxo, and she states that she will make it up to him, but she needs some time. Boxo tries to tell her that she doesn't have to worry about it, and after some time Shuei manages to figure out what he is trying to say, and Boxo then gives her a cola. Shuei then explains that this origin stratum is a place which everyone who goes into the dungeon has to visit. She mentions that unless they enter this stratum, they can't reach the transfer circle, and if someone can't handle transversing the origin stratum, then they have no business moving to the other strata. She states that there are lots of people left in this stratum who, for whatever reason never made it to the transfer circle within, and this is where children who were abandoned here live, and they don't even know the light of the sun or the touch of the wind. Shuei states that her wish is for everyone here to be happy, and she then mentions that she has been a real blabbermouth today, and she asks Boxo to forget everything she said. She then goes to sleep, and later a few ruffians show up thinking that they have heard that there is an unusual magic item here. Boxo then thinks that it's been a while since he has had visitors like this, and he wonders what he should do. He thinks that he can wake up Lammies and the others, but there is a chance that the children would be exposed to danger. Boxo then changes his form, and he starts dispensing smoke, and he then creates the sound of river water using his washing machine. The ruffians get scared seeing all this, and Boxo then attacks them with water using his barrier, and this makes the ruffians run away scared. The next morning Boxo shows everyone the images of what happened last night, and Shuei thinks that these are former hunters who set up base near here. The director then takes a bow, and she states that she is going out for a while. Shuei mentions that she hasn't seen her this mad in a while, and she states that the director is the one who taught her archery. She used to be an expert hunter, and she and Director Bear used to go raiding in the labyrinth, and she is even better than carry oil. An hour later the director returns, and she mentions that she has taken care of all those ruffians, and they were more than happy to listen to her. Boxo thinks that this is what he expected from Shuei's teacher, and he wonders if Shuei will also turn out like this one day. The story continues, and we find out that the Menagerie of Fools is heading to the Dead's Lament Stratum, and Lamis freaks out hearing about this. Hulami states that this stratum is filled with creepy things like corpse fiends and skeleton fiends, and Carrie Oil wonders if Lamis has the time to join them. Hulami then states that Lamis has always been bad with scary stories and stuff, and Lamis mentions that she is not a child anymore. Carrie Oil states that the enemies there are just ghosts and corpses, and Philmina mentions that it's natural to be scared of these things, and Hulami wonders what's the dead's lament stratum like, as she has only heard of it. Philmina states that the sky is covered with fog there, and the lightning flashes continuously, and there are gravestones all over the place that look ready to fall apart. Lamis gets scared hearing this, and Carrie Oil wonders if she is really scared. Lamis states that she is not, as she is not a child anymore, and Hulami mentions that when Lamis was a child, she couldn't even go to the bathroom after hearing a scary story. Carrie Oil then wonders who is going to carry Boxo if Lamis is not coming and Philmina mentions that they can't go on this campaign without Boxo, as this is going to be a long one, and they might have food troubles. Lamis then states that she never said that she is not going to go, and she mentions that she is good with scary stuff. The scene then cuts to the group leaving for the dead's lament stratum, and Lamis finds out that Philmina is not going to join them as she is not good with scary stuff. At the dead's lament stratum, they arrive at an inn, and Carrie Oil mentions that they will be staying here for a while. They go inside, and Lamis gets scared seeing the proprietress, and she faints. Cario can't believe that Lamis is this scared of stuff like this, and Hulami mentions that it was even worse when she was a child. Cario then mentions that they can carry Lamis to her room, but what should they do about Boxo? Boxo then turns into a cardboard vending machine, and Hulami places her in front of the inn. Hulami then mentions that Lamis has always been like this, and she thinks that this takes her back to the old times. Boxo then thinks that these two must be really good friends for Hulami to be talking about her like this, and Hulami mentions that normally Lamis would run away by now, but she can't bear to leave this time. Boxo wonders if she is not leaving because of him, and Hulami tells him to not misread the situation. She mentions that she can't tell Boxo why Lamis is controlling her fear as this might hurt her feelings, and she states that Boxo should take his time thinking this over. Later it's night at the stratum, and Boxo notices a bunch of ghosts and other undead beings gathering in the village. He notices that they are just wandering around without doing anything, but he still puts up a barrier just to be safe. 
Boxo then thinks that he should try some anti-undead goods while he has the chance, and he first tries to attack the undead with some salt, but this does nothing to them. Boxo then tries to throw some idols of gods and other exorcism materials, but they also don't work. Boxo still keeps trying, and the next day Hulami notices a bunch of garbage around the inn, and Boxo thinks that no matter what he tried it didn't have any effect on the undead. Later Carry Oil sends Shui and the twins to go explore the stratum, and he leaves to get some reinforcements. Afterwards the proprietress asks Boxo if he enjoyed last night, and she mentions that monsters appear in the middle of the village when night falls, and only those who have confidence in their skills are allowed to venture out. Boxo hopes that she could have told him this beforehand, and the proprietress states that the monsters envy the living, but they won't do any harm to Boxo as he is more akin to them than he is to humans. Boxo thinks that she is not wrong, but she is even more like a ghost than them. Lamis then comes to Boxo, and she apologizes about the other day. Boxo then thinks that Lamis seems to be in a negative mood, and Hulami comes there, and she mentions that Lamis should overcome her fear if it's a weakness. Lamy states that Hulami is right, and she mentions that she just has to get used to it. Hulami then states that she is going to give Lamis a crash course in overcoming her fear, and she mentions that Lamy should start with strolling through this village. Lamy states that she can't do that, and Hulami mentions that Lamy shouldn't give up that easily. Lamy states that this floor is different from the Clearflow Lake Stratum, and Hulami mentions that Lamy should go back if this is the case. Hulami then states that Lamis has to tough it out, and she mentions that there is a general store at the village entrance, and she asks Lamis to go and buy a restorative potion from there. Lamis tries to take Boxo with her, but Hulami states that she can't take Boxo. Lamis mentions that she can do this even without Boxo, and she tries to go to the store, but she gets scared halfway, and comes back. Lamis then mentions that her job is to carry Boxo, and it's no use if Boxo is not with her. Hulami then tells her to do it this way, and Boxo thinks that Lamis might be able to do this with him around. While on the way Lamis keeps asking Boxo if he is still there, and she tells him to not fall off her back. Boxo thinks that Lamis is like a kid learning how to ride a bike, and he thinks that he should try to help her as she is trying hard. Boxo then uses a new function called Aroma Diffuser to put out the smell of coffee, and he then plays some music which calms down Lamis. The scene then cuts to Lamis telling the others that she managed to get this potion from the store on her own, and the others think that it's great. Hulami mentions that they should move on to the next step now, and she asks Lamis to go around the town without Boxo. Lamis states that she can't do that, and Carrywell then comes there, and he mentions that he has brought reinforcements, and we see that the band of gluttons and Mishel are with him. Boxo then wonders if Mishel will be able to communicate with a group this large, and Carrywell mentions that Mishel has joined their party on a trial basis. He states that he might become a full-fledged member after this campaign, and Mishel mentions that he just wants to make sure that he doesn't get in anyone's way, and see if he can handle teamwork. Carrywell then tells everyone that their goal in coming to this stratum is to find and defeat the King of Souls, and he states that there will be lots of monsters here, but they won't be a problem for their group. The band of gluttons then state that they have heard that humans have trouble with dark places and creepy things, and they can't understand why this is. Boxo thinks that bearcats and humans might have different views about horror, and they then leave to search for the King of Souls. While on the way McKen wonders why there are graves all over the stratum, and the others state that they don't know. Pell mentions that monsters might show up if they leave offerings here, and Carrywell then tells everyone to stay sharp as they have some company. The monsters then show up there, and everyone takes care of them easily. Boxo thinks that there is no contest, and the scene then cuts to Boxo at the village at night. He thinks that after watching for several days, it seems to him that the monsters are looking inside the houses with envy, and he thinks that the rumors that they were once human might be true. An undead kid then comes in front of Boxo, and Boxo thinks that it doesn't mean any harm to him, and it's only looking at him with a child's curiosity. The kid then starts to put his hands on Boxo, and Boxo gives him some corn soup to make him let go. The kid then tries to eat the bottle, and he leaves after a while. The next day the kid shows up again, and Boxo gives him some corn soup once more. He wonders if this kid likes him, and he thinks that this can't be. The same thing keeps happening every night, and Boxo thinks that he is starting to enjoy his late-night interactions with him. 
The scene then cuts to the group spending a night outside the village after exploring, and Boxo thinks that he can't give corn soup to the boy today. He thinks that the boy might be able to do without it for a day, and everyone then hears the sound of an undead. Boxo thinks that it's heading this way, and there is only one of them. Aka and Shiro think that they can handle this on their own, and Boxo helps them, by using his lights. Boxo then notices that the undead is the same kid from before, and Aka kills him before Boxo has a chance to stop him. Aka then notices that the undead kid has one of the drinks from Boxo, and Shiro notices that he also has a copper coin with him. Boxo then thinks that he shouldn't get mad at Aka for this, but he feels sad about this. Boxo wonders if the child was thinking about putting a coin in him, after seeing the others do it, and he thinks that children shouldn't worry about these things. He thinks that he wouldn't be able to buy anything with a single copper coin, and later Carry Oil mentions that he has a good idea of where the King of Souls is. He states that he has thought of a way to deal with him, and he asks Hulami if she knows what kind of monster the King of Souls is. Hulami states that she has heard that he is a great magic user, and Carry Oil mentions that she is right. He states that the king can use different elemental magic, and Hulami wonders what Carrioil wants to do about its magic. Carrioil mentions that they can use Boxo's barrier to defend against it, and he states that it's fine if Boxo and Lamis rush the enemy and keep him distracted or take him down. Boxo thinks that this must have been the real reason why Carrioil brought him along, and Hulami states that she has heard that Boxo managed to block the attacks from the magic users who attack Mishel. Carrioil states that he can redo the plan if Boxo doesn't like it, and Boxo mentions that he is fine with it. Carrioil then states that the King of Souls has a number of monsters serving it, and he mentions that the others will take care of the rest of them. Carrioil then states that the rest depends on what happens when they reach the King of Souls, and they then have a toast. The story continues, and Shiro mentions that Aka has found a monster up ahead which looks like the King of Souls. The group then goes to check this out and Aka states that up ahead are the King of Souls and the monsters that he commands. Carrioil notices that there are 22 monsters in total, and Shue states that they could have wiped them out with magic if the vice captain was here. She wonders if she can take some of them out using her arrows, and Boxo then transforms into a petrol vending machine. Hulami wonders what this is, and she finds out that some kind of oil is coming out of it. She tries to burn the oil, and she notices that it's highly flammable, and she realizes that Boxo wants them to burn the enemy with this. The group then throws the petrol on the monsters with the help of some bottles, and they burn the enemy up with some fire spells. The King of Souls then attacks Carry Oil and the others, and Boxo uses his barrier to protect everyone. The King of Souls then thinks that this pale blue light must be a barrier, and he then uses an earth spell to separate Lamis and the others. The King of Souls then fights Lamis, and he blows away Boxo's barrier with a wind spell, but he can't blow away Lamis, and Lamis keep heading towards him. The King of Souls wonders how Lamis can withstand his wind spell, and he thinks that he has underestimated Lamis, and he then splits the ground below Lamis, and Lamis falls inside the pit. Boxo then transforms into a cardboard vending machine, and Lamis manages to jump out of the pit before the King of Souls can close it. The King of Souls then tries to attack Lamis, but Shue stops him with an arrow, and Lamis then uses Boxo as a weapon to defeat the King of Souls. Carrioil states that he never expected Lamis and Boxo to take out the King of Souls, and we see that the King of Souls is still barely alive. The King of Souls then mentions that he is not merely a stratum lord, and some kind of attack then hits everyone there. The attack stops after a while, and we see that this attack has dealt a heavy damage to everyone. Everyone then gets up, and they notice that another undead monster has appeared there, and this monster knows that Boxo came here from another world. Lamis then asks him who he is, and monster states that they can call him the Netherlord. The Netherlord checks out the coin dropped by the King of Souls, and he thinks that this is of no interest to him. Lamis wonders why he is doing this, and the Netherlord states that there is nothing wrong with him hunting. He mentions that they also attack the King of Souls to satisfy their own desires, and this is no different from what they did. Mishul then sneaks around the Netherlord, and he tries to attack him, but the Netherlord takes him down. The Netherlord mentions that blindsiding him is not going to work, and Hulami then states that Lamy shouldn't try to fight that thing head-on, and she uses petrol with Shue's fire arrow to attack the Netherlord. This doesn't do any damage to the Netherlord, and he stops the others from leaving. The Netherlord then grabs a hold of Hulami and Shue, and he attacks them. 
Lamis tries to stop the Netherlord, but it's too late, and both Hulami and Xu Wei stop responding. The sight of her dead friends makes Lamis angry, and she states that Hulami promised her that she would never leave her. Lamis then attacks the Netherlord, and she keeps on attacking, but the Netherlord dodges all of her attacks. Boxo then tells Lamis to try to calm down, and Lamis states that she knows this, but if she doesn't do something now then everyone here will be killed. Boxo thinks that he has a plan, but Lamis will die needlessly if this doesn't work. The Netherlord then attacks Lamis with his spell, but Boxo manages to protect her in the nick of time, and Lamis states that she believed that Boxo was going to protect her. Boxo then thinks that he should also believe in Lamis's strength, and he turns himself into a cardboard vending machine. Lamis thinks that Boxo must have some kind of plan, and Boxo then transforms into a balloon vending machine, and he starts blowing up balloons. The Netherlord then states that Lamis will soon be reunited with her fellow friends, and it tries to attack her, but Boxo launches Lamis out of her barrier, and he also launches some balloons to hide her. Lamis then manages to attack the Netherlord by hiding in the cloud of balloons, and her attack manages to break the Netherlord's arm. The Netherlord mentions that he never expected Lamis to break off his arm, and he states that he will look forward to seeing how their group is going to grow, and he leaves. Lamis then goes to check up on Hulami, and she mentions that Hulami can't leave her like this, as she promised that she would help her out, and she will stay with her forever. Lamis is crying wakes up Carry Oil, and he checks up Shuei, and he tries to give her a cardiac massage. He tells Lamis to do the same thing for Hulami, and seeing them giving cardiac massage gives Boxo an idea. Boxo then changes forms, and Carry Oil thinks that Boxo must want them to use this somehow. Lamis thinks that she has never seen this form before, and Boxo thinks that even in his old world not many people knew how to use an automated external defibrillator. He thinks that this holds even more true for the residents of this world, and Boxo thinks that he doesn't have time to explain, and he unlocks the telekinesis function. Boxo then gives the AED box to Lamis, and Lamis follows the visual instructions in the box to get Hulami ready for resuscitation. Boxo increases his dexterity with his remaining points to increase the likelihood of saving the girls, and he then places the defibrillator on Hulami, and he gives her a shock. The machine then tells Lamis to give cardiac massage to Hulami, and Hulami does so, but nothing happens. Boxo wonders if he was too late, and Lamis tells Hulami that she is going to be fine as Boxo helped them. She asks Hulami to open her eyes, and Hulami then wakes up. Carry Oil then asks Boxo to do the same thing for Shuei, and they manage to revive Shuei the same way. Carry Oil is glad to see that Shuei is alive, and Boxo thinks that the residents of this world are sturdier than he thought. The scene then cuts to Hulami, and Shuei in some kind of medical facility, and Mashul apologizes to them for exposing them to danger even when he was accompanying them. Hulami states that he shouldn't feel bad, and she mentions that the Netherlord is really bad news, and they have to inform Director Bear about this. Boxo thinks that he really was a monstrous opponent, and he wonders if he will be able to protect everyone the next time. Boxo then states that several days later Hulami and Shuei recovered, and they returned to the Clearflow Lake Stratum, and they reported the incident to Director Bear. The director now mentions that he has heard about the Netherlord in old records, and he is a general serving the Demon Lord. He states that he is going to request an emergency meeting with the directors of each stratum, and he tells everyone to get plenty of rest in case something unexpected happens. Everyone understands, and Lamis then returns to her inn, and the innkeeper and Manami are happy to see that she is safe. They mention that they have heard that she fought an enemy stronger than a stratum lord, and they state that they were worried. Boxo then mentions that the story about them fighting the Netherlord had spread throughout the whole village, and everyone told Boxo that he did a great job, and he is an indispensable part of their village. Swari then mentions that this makes her even more interested in Boxo, and she mentions that she is going to have him all to herself someday. She states that Boxo should enjoy his time with Lamis until then, and she leaves. The scene then cuts to Mashul thinking that there are too many people in this village, and the band of gluttons then comes to him. They ask Mishul what he is going to do after this, and they ask him to fight alongside them as they will be too scared to do anything if an enemy like the Netherlord shows up again. Mishul mentions that the Netherlord defeated him easily in the last battle, and he states that this is why he is going to become stronger. He mentions that he won't lose the next time, and the Bearcats are glad to hear this.
McKen then states that he has heard that Director Bear is going to summon a lot of expert hunters from all the stratums, and he might even be able to gather a thousand of them. Mishul then gets cold feet, finding out that he has to deal with so many people, and he sighs. The scene then cuts to Filmina asking Karyo what he is thinking, and Karyo mentions that he has no problem if he dies while trying to fulfill his wish, but he is not sure about putting other people's lives in danger due to his own wish. He states that he doesn't even know if they will be able to accomplish their goal in the end, and Aaka states that it's not like Karyo to say things like these. Shiro states that a look that's serious doesn't suit Karyo, and they mention that it was their own decision to follow him. Carrie Oil wonders since when did these two started saying such commendable things, and he states that they will be going on a hunt tomorrow, and he tells everyone to prepare for it. Boxo then mentions that one morning Lammies put him on her back, and she departed from the village, and he wonders where they are going. They then arrive at the destination, and Boxo notices that this is the place where they first met. Lammy states that this is the place where Boxo first saved her, and she mentions that so many things have happened since she got to know Boxo. She states that plenty of those things were dangerous, but Boxo protected her every time. Lamis then wonders if Boxo is thinking that everyone got hurt because of him in this last battle, and she mentions that this is not true. She states that it's because Boxo was there that she did not get hurt, and Hulami and Shuei are still alive because of Boxo as well. She tells Boxo to not think about sad things, and Boxo is amazed to see that Lamis cares so much about a vending machine like him. Shuei and Hulami then come there, and they state that they were thinking about cheering these two up, but it looks like they didn't need their help. They then mention that they still haven't thanked Boxo for saving them, and they both then kiss Boxo. They state that Lamis should also thank Boxo, and Lamis thinks that she has to do it, as Boxo helped her as well, but she hesitates, and Hulami then pushes her into kissing Boxo. This makes Lamis embarrassed, and she gets mad at Hulami for pushing her like this. Thanks for watching parts 1 to 12, the rest of the parts will be on my channel. Please like and share the video if you enjoyed it, and make sure to hit the subscribe button, and turn on the notification bell to keep getting new anime recap updates.